start from what Matt showed you yesterday. So Matt showed you uh, Walter Pickler, who was the sculptor working as an architect. And this is two sheets by Hans Hollein, who was the architect working as a sculptor. So they were both in the, um, in the southwest of, uh, of the US, in Arizona. And they, uh, this duo I, I find interesting because you see that they were looking at actual things. So these are the mesa, uh, mesa. mesa structures. So um, pre the pre-Columbian structures of, of, of the, the United States. Uh, and they were using this as examples to imagine their, their, their utopian cities. Uh, so like the one that, uh, that Matt showed you yesterday, this, uh, this is one of the many versions that Holland created. So they are cities as machines, underground cities, overground cities, floating cities. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, a, it's a city as a ready-made machine that could, there's, there's even a, a, an interesting version, which is a city that travels across the territory, mining for the, for the resources that it needs and then continuing its its path uh, depleting the, the entire territory so it's uh, it's a different way of looking at the, at the site and using uh, the context as a reference to create something completely new but at the same way grounded in the long history of the, the tradition of occupying these these sites um, I mean it's worth saying that these sheets come from the same sketchbook. Yeah. Mm. yeah. And it was the sketchbook, the large sketchbook that Holland used as he went across America. So he first went to the Indian sites and then literally on the next page is drawing the the, the fantasy city. If you know the Desert of Retz, it's a, it's a very famous garden just outside uh, just outside Paris, uh, he's the, the, the nobleman that employed Boulet to create his mm. palace in Paris. And there's a, there, there's a myth that Boulet also worked on this site. It's not confirmed, but uh, it's, it's, a, it's a garden that mixes the tradition of uh, French gardens with already a lot of the logics from the, the oriental examples that were uh, in Europe and where he creates a landscape of ruin, false ruins, and those are probably the most famous features of the garden. So he has a ruined temple, a ruined tower, the ruined pyramid. So it's kind of the, the, the it's full of Masonic references. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a cultural landscape that projects the, 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 the enlightened client, uh, which was a, a big feature in the, in, the, in, in this period in French society. And this is a reworking of the site, continuing the logic of using the ruins of Western civilization to expand on the site. So this is Martin Uzi, who Neil will tell you much more about than, than I ever could. But um, yeah, no, a, 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 a French radical figure of the 1970s. Mm -hmm. He um, was so con connected to Ireland in some way. Very much connected yeah. to Ireland. Uh, yeah. And this is his mm -hmm. sketchbook. Yes for the project. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, just as a, a sort of history of collecting thing, um, I got Crazy. the sketchbook <laughs> and then I had the yes. opportunity to buy the two larger sheets and yeah. it became a, it's a wonderful sketchbook. Yeah. Yeah. So in the sketchbook he's collecting references of yeah. additional ruins of Western civilization to superimpose on the site to complete the, the zone to collect the, the the most interesting examples of uh, ruins of thermal baths, ruins of churches, ruins of castles, ruins, and he completes the, the site. Some other connected uh, ideas here, it's, it's this idea of the English landscape garden and how to, exactly what I was telling you about uh, for Caesar looking at the ruins of the, the agricultural landscape of Malagueta trying to ground his plan. This is so. This is um, William Kent mm -hmm. talking to his client. So it was folded then and sent to the client as a as a um, uh, a, a letter. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so it's and it's a very very early document. Um, 
in the kind of development of the English picturesque. So again, relevant to Starhead, which you'll see tomorrow, but this is um, 20 years earlier. Um, and one of the things that people, I always say, forget about the picturesque is that these radical experiments in landscape happened first on the outskirts of London, where the space was more limited. So what what the landscape architect was commissioned to do or was imagining he was doing was creating this kind of um, uh, infinite landscape. Um, uh, the, the picturesque is a device for making space go further. That's it. And um, he was catering to, they were catering to uh, clients who had a house in London, a house outside London where they went sometimes for the weekend or sometimes only for... Um, uh, a, a night or whatever um, it was the generation later where the picturesque as it were escaped into the into the countryside this is basically looking he's looking onto Richmond Common and he has appropriated uh, a grand house on the next hill as a folly in the landscape so the house that um, the house that he's building is is um, standing here and he's giving the client an idea of how the landscape um, uh, will will uh, look he's giving he's offering this idea about a, a, a about countryside if you like and the thing one of the things I like about it best of all is here he's done a calculation of the amount of rent that the landlord will lose by um, uh, from uh, planting this landscape, so there's a there's a cost calculation. There's a very very pragmatic cost calculation involved in the in the um, project. Um, William Kent, if you don't know him, is uh, responsible for everything in the 18th century. He's the great for me the great innovator. Comes back. From um, from a long tour in Italy with uh, 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 a huge quantity of Palladio drawings, which he distributes to his clients and uh, generates this whole change in taste in England. And in parallel in France. <laughs> and in parallel in France, exactly. This is um, 40, 50 years later. This is at the beginning of the 1780s. Um, and we actually don't know who definitively who this album is by. Um, there are two French art historians who I hope one day will fight a duel mm -hmm. about because one claims it's by Paris and the other claims it's by Le Coeur. And I, in a way, I don't care. I love these arguments um, uh, unfolding. Um, but there's there's a, a whiff of Caesar in this. Mm. Um, this is mostly observation. He's actually going round the... There was this incredible building boom going on, um, uh, particularly in the Chaussée d'Anton, just um, by the Gare Saint-Lazare at, at that period, and everybody was, was wanted a house there and so on. So he's recording houses by Ledoux, houses by Boulay, um, uh, um, and... Um, uh, and then suddenly in the middle of it there's this um, uh, um, very highly developed landscape scheme for a, a um, for a formal garden and this is actually this one even I like better um, trying to establish the relationship of the, the garden to the, to the house um, and then he's back on mouldings, and so it's a story again about working at every possible scale. So proportional, mm -hmm. without any rules. Because this is the thing. The training. The training. That no, but is this is the thing that. that it's so super difficult good. right now to find someone that can draw with a ruler in proportions. Mm -hmm. 
you know, this kind yeah. of so everything is like if you have made it with a ruler, no? It's all about this is the line. We should show you. This is something. The ruler is in your hand. Yes, but you don't need a ruler. ruler. The ruler is the scale is incorporated in the hand. And this. No, it's is que ¿Qué te parece los dibujos? Oh. Es que alucino de fina. If I may say so, this is something that only the French can do. Mira, eh. Mira la proporción. So this is the, this is um, 1810, and this is Hippolyte Le Bar uh, traveling through um, Italy. Oh my God. This. Mm. Yeah. this is crazy. Eh? <laughs> no, this is so much. It's so beautiful. Mm. Sorry, we've got distracted. No, but from it's from it's just just <laughs> no not at all. But, that's but in right. a way, that's it doesn't idea. matter. Let's, but yeah. this is a show us how can sophisticate the brain and the human being can be and we are not you know like this is we will be no we are we, not we are losing we are losing this. Yeah, but we don't train enough i mean this guy yes but it's true like we want to yeah. we want to go to the olympics but we don't go to the swimming pool here yeah. yeah. exactly. how yeah. Yeah. we can change the world if we, <laughs> es que estamos en la mierda. This is, this is, look at this es que yo tengo calor me estoy mareando <laughs> but this is incredible. You have to go into the schools of architecture. In Augsburg, too. No. No, Neil, we need this. I hear he had a ruler, but it's yeah, done with, with a... Mira el ruler. No, I mean... You have to go into the schools of architecture. Oh, the schools have to come here. Or well, you can create mm -hmm. a school of architecture. <laughs> no, man, here is a, this, this is alucinant. So these people are talking, talking, talking. Come and see it, no? <laughs> the frustration for me is that this is a kind of object that almost doesn't survive from the 18th century. Yeah. Because of the same conversation we were having about the Raphael drawings. Um, this is something made for entirely personal purposes. Mm -hmm. And uh, what was valued was were the drawings that were sent to the salon or the finished presentation drawings rather than the plan. Or the building only. Or yeah. the building. And yeah. the building well, the building was was yeah, yeah was was the record. The record. Yeah. Um, so this is, by the way, this is somebody very young. This is some, someone very young. This is somebody very young, eating with his eyes. You know, just. Um, but, like, but like this, this like, young, like these guys. Like these guys. Yeah. He was doing this with your age. ¿Qué os parece? Um, so, just so we could get back on yes, 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 track, yes. Um, this is a, uh, it's, it's a drawing that's hard to read, but it's no, by, it. it's by uh, John Talman and is a um, project for, for, again, from a sketchbook, um, a project for a um, English garden. Um, there was a theory that it was even... Um, it's very hard to relate it to the um, topography, mm. um, but this was a monumental building he did for William of Orange at Hampton Court, which is how we can identify it as as Talman. Look at him, But it's actually interesting in this context because um, uh, dueling strategies. Dueling strategies, exactly. No, but also I have to say. O sea, I, I'm going to cry la... Es que es demasiado bonito. You know, I say to all my students all the time, work with superposition. You know, like, people are just putting things inside boxes and closing things. This is about opening, about drawing with pencil, drawing with ink. You know, like, scale. This is about, no, no, like, opening up. But for doing this, you have to have a strong technique. And this is the point in the schools of architecture now that for me is missing, that you are asking the students, uh, 
something that is impossible or you, if you don't have the technique, it's very difficult to arrive to this moment. Look at this freedom, the freedom, the superpositions, you know, the relations, the, you know, the, it's, it's about, you know, like how you teach this <laughs> with a computer, come on. It's, it's just impossible. So this, for me, this is amazing because it's about, you know, like you can f see the, the brain of this person trying to understand the whole and with this superposition, no? And pff, very, no, es que a mí me, me encanta. O sea, mira el dibujo. This is, uh, this is it. Just to begin to think. It's not about the thing in itself. You know, it's about to give you the tools that something happens. And look, it's getting not very alucinant. It's also wonderful thinking about it in the context of the Caesar drawings. Es que es eso. Yeah, yeah. It Absolutely. reminds me it's to, the same, no? Yeah. It's the same exercise. Yeah. Yes, you know, like it's super contemporary. So we cannot read it as something that happened. Yeah. It's something that we, it can happen today if you want mm -hmm. but you we have to go for it but we have to give but it's a problem of the schools of architecture as i tell you huh? it's about what you want you know like you want people that, that develop the, this kind of thinking or you want people that just to follow the rules i don't know this is about you know connections and going for it no i i love it so it's alucinante if you if you think about what you saw of William Kent, um, this is this is fun to do. Yeah, these are this is how he quickly depicts an idea of constructing a gaze, constructing a way of looking at the landscape, and this is a highly scientific representation of the landscape that you can view to show to okay. a potential client or uh, yeah how to create a panorama so so basically this if if you see mm -hmm, it, this mm -hmm. and that it's the same structure mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so if you go into the castle and go to the rooftop this is the 360 degree panorama that you have from the top and th this was a very very important instrument for many architects for mm -hmm. instance uh, Schinkel the, the mm -hmm. German architect that you'll see on the on Wednesday uh, he started his career doing panoramas of, of, of cities. There's a very famous one of Palermo that has been uh, published widely, but, but it's, it's this, this idea of constructing a, a, land, a landscape through a series of events where you have a constructed path that leads you to a point that gives you a certain view of an object, a landscape, a horizon, something. And uh, so they develop ways of representing uh, what can be seen from a, from a site so that then they decide how big a window should be, if it should, if it should be vertical, horizontal. So, so, so you, you, that's one of the mechanisms that leads to the uh, destruction of the, the, the classical composition of the facade because windows need to be different in different rooms so that you have different connections with the, with, the, with the outside. So you can create a straight line from thinking like this to a facade designed by Adolf Luz or Le Corbusier mm -hmm. because uh, you were creating seven or ten different ways of looking to, to the landscape. So you needed seven or ten different types of windows, proportions of rooms, heights, uh, colors, designs, furniture and all that, that goes uh, with that, and in Schinkel's career, you see that development fully, so you can trace in one single person how understanding how to look at the landscape like that leads to a different mm -hmm. way of designing architecture. Mm -hmm. So that's, um, yeah. And, and it's worth, I think, perhaps adding that this was a, it was partly that, I mean, this is actually the preliminary drawing by a painter, not an architect. Mm -hmm. This is Norwich in East Anglia, um, and it was part of a movement which was really all across Europe uh, to do these painted panoramas um, where the public was bought a ticket and went in to, to so they they could, as it were, be standing here metaphorically and see 
these campuses, which were sometimes 25 feet high. Um, um, so it, it wasn't, it, it, the architects were responding to a, a, a perceived need to change their understanding of how you looked at things in the city. Mm. And, the, the, and a lot of that was to do with technological inventions that made it possible to, to, to do these illuminated panoramas. Mm -hmm. It was mostly to do with lighting. So this is a, 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 an architect, living architect, Peter Wilson, um, who I um, admire very much and by whom we have a really fantastic um, quantity of very, very different material. Um, this is Peter in the middle of the 1980s, um, commissioned very much like the Martin Lutzi scheme or the um, uh, Kent scheme. Actually, he was commissioned with his students from the AA to rethink and remodel an 18th century landscape in Ireland, in Northern Ireland, called Clanderboy. Um, and so again, here are the here's the sketchbook, and these are part of maybe a hundred drawings that we have, where he's first of all, I mean, and the, the sequence begins with these this material where he's trying to understand and put impose an order on the landscape, and then as the project develops. He produces bridges, towers, libraries, and so on throughout the whole landscape. Um, the sketchbook is actually... I mean, that you have to look very... There's the gatehouse, the bridge, the yeah, artists, the uh, pavilion, yeah, several structures. And, and, and it's again... Like Caesar, like many of the others that you saw today, uh, working in with the leftovers of a of a of a constructed landscape, in this case the grounds of a of a of a large house, um, and analyzing the features of the of the site, seeing what's need what's the minimum amount of intervention needed to transform it again <laughs> into a public uh, ground and. Uh, to open it as a as a park, and then he develops this this uh, small pavilion buildings, the the gatehouse, the the artist pavilion, and all that to to create to recreate this landscape as a new public park. It's an unbuilt project, sadly, but it's, it's very interesting in the way that that is uh, conceived and 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 as it compares to to lots of other things that that we'll see. The, the office now is known as Boulders and Wilson. You probably know. Um, if you ever go, the, the library that they built in Munster, which was his, um, Peter's first sort of significant public project, is absolutely a wonderful building. It's really, really something. And they're also very well known for a, a theatre that they did in Rotterdam, the Luxor Theatre, a red uh, building. No, what, what for me is incredible is that the croquis yeah. is like looking at the soul of this man. Yeah. You have access uh, at his soul in two seconds. Yeah. No, we are it's okay, okay. so intimate, no? Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. You know, the, I mean, this kind of intimacy that is not about professional, it's about grasping the soul of this architect. No, there. It's about no self-consciousness about um, anybody else looking at it but him. I mean, yeah. This is a purely personal wow. record. And he gave you, the, he gave this to you. Sorry? He gave this to you. He gave that to me. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he did. I remember it was very touching. But uh, in this case, I was not. Yeah, very, very it's often. not about quantity or mm -hmm. numbers. It's about creating the relation and the, so that's why perhaps it's so precious we could, because we can feel all the love that you have and all these drawings. Oh my God. And, and they, they also all 
captured a significant moment, especially when it relates to the, to the to the second half of the 20th century. They 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 are all super significant moments in the career of these architects that Neil discusses with them for a long time. So, what was the key moment of discovery in your career to understand what is your uh, what are your interests what's what's your project uh, the, the toughest thing mm -hmm. is that when the conversations begin they all want to give me the drawings they did last week for the building they just opened da, 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 da. Yeah. and what we're always trying to do is push back to the moment when they mm -hmm. were doing something really radical mm. yes yeah, trying to find but what, what I found f fantastic is that you are putting a lot of different uh, kush. It's not Players. only about mm. techniques, it's about understand why, you know, like breaking the, you know, like in a breaking moment that was important that something happened. Mm. It's, it's difficult. It's difficult because. I always feel because architects are, and I should perhaps not say this in this company, but architects are very lucky mm -hmm. to have radical moments because it's not just them. It's the world around them where it's they true. can have an agency and change something. Um, uh, yeah, but, but it's so often, like with Caesar, it's so often about the architect realizing the opportunity and then you the, the excitement is communicated in the drawings always mm -hmm. that's why i say that good buildings produce good drawings it's not the it's the wrong way around but you you know what i mean that if you if you've got a good idea you will have to represent it in some mm -hmm. radical mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. Way and you'll feel that. From mm -hmm. the so the concept is also the drawing. Yeah, mm -hmm. the concept is. Because we are now saying, please have a concept and draw it. Mm -hmm. No, the way you draw it is already a conceptual thing. So it's, you, we cannot separate the things. Yeah. Those decisions about how it's, you draw it. Yes. You, are part of the a part of the project. Mm -hmm. I think we should show them. Yeah, because yeah. this, yeah. this is a. This is a. This is Peter as well. And um, is a sorry, sorry, is a sorry, completely sorry. wonderful thing, but I need I need collaborators. Yeah, oh, I'll start from this side. Oh. So this is something that he did in um, ten years later. Um, um, and what what this sketchbook is about? It's called a Leporello, and it's actually. Um, um, the, the, the book is actually Japanese but what he's trying to do by his own account and there's a very nice text about it on the website what he's trying to do is come to terms with his own he's left London he's gone to live in um, northern Germany um, and he's trying to understand the northern European industrial landscape so it's almost like it's drawn from the window of a train or whatever. It's it's, um, but it's a fantastic thing, and it gets better. <laughs> so there are some specific building projects in here. But this has something about drawing by like, like kids, uh, you know, like very... How did you do it, technically? But the other thing about it is... Well, I'll show you at the end. Um, but then... What I also think is nice about it is that you can also treat it like a sketchbook. Do yes. something else. So this makes, in a way, in a very extreme way, this point, uh, this thing I was saying the other day about, yesterday, about 
when you turn the page. Mm -hmm. It makes it incredibly immediate because the drawing actually continues across the page. Pero que, que técnica es esta? Es He's, uh, the other thing about Peter is oh, that he's always transfer. experimenting with <laughs> techniques. Transfer. So we have some early drawings that he did um, when um, he was still teaching at the AA where he uses, he says he uses boot polish mm -hmm. to get the textures that he wants. Mm -hmm. But this is about narrative, no? Mm -hmm. As well, yeah. Trying to make a whole of the, the, the leftovers of the Industrial Revolution in the court of Europe. Yes. Mm. Yeah. No, it's a magic thing. <laughs> You guys on the other side want to look at it. <laughs> wow. So this is continuing on um, different ways of, uh, of looking at the site to, to, to get the, 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 the ideas to, to, to develop the project. So these two and the two that are there uh, in the book is on the work of Alberto Ponige. This was published recently in, in Zurich by Park Books. And it's, it's an interesting way to go into the work of this, of this architect uh, in, in Sardinia. So he has an interesting story. He worked here in, in, in London for, for an architect called uh, Erno Goldfinger. You might recognize the Goldfinger name because he was one of the villains in uh, James Bond because uh, the author of James Bond um, hated the house that uh, Goldfinger built in front of his own house. So he crafted Goldfinger as one of the villains in his series. But when when he started, it goes back to to, to his um, to, to to Sardinia and he starts to build, and that's one of the first projects that, that he develops a, a path in between two, two structures for a for a golf club that is for a yacht club. Sorry, here he has to tackle with a very very difficult uh, topography. So uh, a landscape that is full of gigantic boulders, which is something that if you ever work on a site is virtually impossible to. to to, to get properly represented in a in a survey, you you can never have enough this detail. Is this Stephanie Bender? Mm -hmm. Sorry, no, no, <laughs> but it's about landscape. Yeah. So so y y y you have to have these constant interactions in between surveying the site, designing a first try, uh, working over the drawing, remeasuring, seeing the the different levels that you have to 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 work with to have just enough space to pass because he didn't want to alter the 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 vast majority of the landscape he just wanted to find a way to go through uh, these boulders to to connect these two structures in that case so in the top you have a more of a representational drawing of of the the idea of the project that shows in the path that negotiates all this all this uh, minimal space to cross in between the, 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 the boulders and in the bottom you have notes that he takes about how many, how, how many steps he needs for the difference in levels, how much space he has for the, for the path, if he has to make changes to certain points to, to create sufficient path to, to, to sufficient space to, to go through and, and what I find very interesting in, in this project is because he's working with such such difficult sites. There's this constant iterations in between uh, uh, design drawings and redesign drawings, and the same in this uh, for a house, which is not represented in, in in the book. But you have this constant iteration. Let me pass it. It's fantastic. And look the detail of the... In between, let's... Yeah, they're turned the same way. So you have the, the house and the swimming pool. 
in the swimming pool and the structure of the house and here he's negotiating what are the limits until when he can build without uh, being too close or, or uh, destroying the, the the beauty of the of the rock line how to integrate the rock outcrops in the structures of the of the house and that if you go through the book is something that you see quite a lot some of the rocks are integrated into the into the structure and you have this also also this interesting negotiation you have the perimeter of the house and then you have the perimeter of the roof that is not the same at the, and that interacts with the with the rock in a, in a different way so he's constructing this uh, he's carefully negotiating this this very tight space in between uh, integrating the rocks and not uh, uh, not damaging the the site and this takes a very very long uh, interactive exercise in between design redesign re-redesign going back and forth going to the site measuring seeing what the height needs to be and then negotiating as you see here that he needs to go down 10 centimeters or needs to go down a meter and a half and this can be the maximum width of the pool you can have a rock inside the pool there's important rocks that should be at the border of the pool so he takes all these notes uh, and this is what helps him get to the site and build something close to what he intends because the survey will never really be mm -hmm. an accurate depiction of of the site so this is something that needs to be followed quite closely in the building phase so that the, the end result is close to what he imagined it's not something that you can design in the office you need to you need to, to be physically in the site for a long long time to to manage to, to 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 fully develop this project and it's quite interesting in the in that most if not all of his buildings have these very very challenging settings where he has to go back and forth in between the site and the, the drawing table to to develop the project so manuel yeah i i have a question because it's like he has a base that was printed. Yeah, so he, no? he would make, th this is not uh, an example of, of a base. This, this is, is printed and then he goes yeah. to the site. Yeah. So he has a base to work. No? And, and he marks. You know, like it's like you print a base, then you yeah. go to the site and then in the site you rework. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But you don't go with a claro in the site. The site is difficult, no? Yeah. Because you have to and have a base. The same there, I think. Sure it is. It is the you same. know, like so. So you built it for you, like a document for the site, and then you redraw and you transform with notes and you know, like so you go with something with to the site. Yeah, a base to work on. Yeah. And it's like a way of observation uh, from the real. It's like the stairs from wells, no? Yeah. How they have been done. Yesterday I, I were talking. I was talking with with Rafa, no? Is this a drawing, or this is perhaps an idea that yeah. you draw and then you measure on the side, uh, you know? So these are these kind of superposition of methodologies that this is super strong, no? Yeah. Yeah. So it's not that you finish the drawings. And then you give to another person, and then the person will. It's about going to the site, filling the site, and then blah, blah, blah. Yeah, and then taking all the notes that you can. Like no, this? From this space, you have a wonderful panorama. From these two points, you have interesting possibilities of, of viewing in between the rocks. So it's about. So what he was commissioned to do was to create a 200 meter path. If he was a lazy architect, it would be very easy. He, just, <laughs> <laughs> he could do it in five minutes, but instead he chose to really uh, go deep into the, 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 the character of the site, trying to maintain as much as possible and taking away as much as possible from this opportunity of creating a, a, an event space or a space full of, full of opportunities from what was there and that he had to do through careful observation, multiple visits. And this is, uh, I could also t t tell you parallel examples of, of CISA. One of the very first uh, public commissions he got was for a tea house in a similar rocky site. And he spent uh, months drawing the rocks to find out what would be the most adequate level for the program so that the building interacts in a proper way with the rocks. 
uh, and these are projects where often architects lose a lot of money because no client would pay him enough money for a 200 meter path <laughs> to justify the thousands of hours he is, he is spending uh, going through the site and, and reworking it to to perfection in the sense that it's the most accurate representation of the idea that he wants to to build uh, so, so so it's a labor of passion a labor of love it's not about uh, mm -hmm. it's it's not about the program it's not about the brief it's not about the client it's not about the site it's about your inner anxieties and the the, the thing that you want to, to to project onto the onto this opportunity because uh, you have also to imagine he was a couple of years older than you are now. He was getting one of his first commissions. It's a path. So uh, if you say it like that, it's not much. But from that, you can, con yeah, you can construct a whole <laughs> theory of intervention in the landscape. You can construct a whole uh, attitude for your entire career. Because in this, there's a prototype of everything that he then developed in his subsequent projects. And in most of the architects that we are seeing, this is, uh, this is something that, that, that features often in, in the collection, like what, what, what uh, Drawing Matter tries, to, tries to, to gather are these type of moments when an architect really understands what his interests are, what his life project is about. And he chases it endlessly until he, he manages to find uh, a perfect representation of that idea. So. No, but, but what is fantastic is the quantity of intensity yeah. for a horizontal, no? A path. Yeah. And what can the drawing do with only a path? You know, like, and we are seeing cities, you know, like, but also a path, you know, like, if they say you, Let's build a path. So, some of you will say, this is not even architecture. You know, like, why you put two tall piedras and stuff, but look what he's doing with a path, no? An universe, you know, like, it's... So this is the site plan of Falling Water, the famous house by... No. <laughs> no. Yes. So Edgar J. Kaufman residence, Bear Run, Pennsylvania, the plot plan. So you have uh, the f one of the accurate surveys that, that the wow. office of Frank Lloyd Wright was doing to, to know how to, how to site the, the house, uh, how to install the, the, the structure. And for instance, from this plan, interesting things happen. Uh, for instance, the decision of uh, y using cantilevered structures for most of the building, because he understood that he needed to reduce the footprint of the building in the site as much as possible to to keep the the, the slope towards the river, the to keep the, the the continuity of the topography of the landscape. So there's there's a at the end. It's not rep represented here, but there, there's a very minimal intervention going across and around to the, through the back of the building in the road. But the thing that you see in between the house and the river uh, is trying to minimize the impact of the of the building on the soil. So you have all these balconies projecting from a, a central core of the structure, which is a version of what is designed here. And you have this uh, this idea of uh, maintaining as much as possible this this continuous topography sloping down to, to the river that, that sits here. So this is an early uh, plot plan for the, for the project, not a final version. Uh, and this is just to finish this table. So uh, Le Corbusier, towards the end of his life, he got mm. a commission to design. Uh, it was an interesting period uh, in Iraq. Uh, the government commissioned uh, several uh, modern architects to design public buildings. Le Corbusier was to design uh, a stadium and a sports pavilion. This is Le Corbusier? Yeah, this is Le Corbusier, yeah. So all this is Le Corbusier. These are two drawings of uh, uh, for Roland Garros, the site where the tennis tournament just finished. And it's, uh, yeah, they're, they're quick sketches of, of, of him. Le Corbusier, I can yeah. look him. It's not a machine. 
and this is the side plan. So if that is working from the side, this is kind of imposing on the side on this side. Uh, one thing that always uh, both amazes me and annoys me when I see a sketch by Mies is that the features of the landscape that exist on the side follow the same vantage point as the wall of his houses. So he's, he's appropriating the landscape that exists outside of the house as if it's part of the house, as if it's another wall, another floor, another thing. So you have, these are three sketches for the, for the same house and then build house in, in, in the US. Sorry, it's, it's a reverse, so it's three, three views around the, the living room space. Features, so there's always the river and the curtain of trees and, and it's, uh, there is in me this absence of, of or this idea of the absence of limit because it's glazed walls, but it's just like a curtain or like an architectural element that creates a, a first barrier that is read completely different if you imagine it during the day or the, during the night because glass is not transparent during the night it reflects the light of the of, of the space where you are so it becomes a an opaque wall but when it's a semi-transparent device, the, 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 the wall that encloses the space is formed by the curtain of trees or by the, the water line or by the shore. And you, in, every, in every house that you, that you go see of me, you have these very abstract plans. But if you look at the pictures, you will always see that the landscape around the house is carefully constructed mm -hmm. to create levels of intimacy and, or, or, or openness. For instance, in the Farnsworth house that you all know, you can see, for instance, the, the proximity in between the bedroom and the tree line and the distance that there is in between the living room and the, and the river and the tree line by the river. So there's two completely different logics of, of intimacy in the two, two spaces of the house that you will never see from the plans that he produces mm -hmm. because he was not thinking through, through the plans. He was thinking through these ways of viewing the, 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 the house in relation to the landscape and the house as a, as a device to dominate the landscape and the landscape as another architectural element to construct the, the building. So, and, and that is more or less the same way as Aspen's the first presentation set of the Stockholm Cemetery. Presentation. And that's the, the, the main path, the, the cross, the crematorium, so the, all the buildings that he was, uh, that he was doing in, uh, in collaboration with, with Leverance at this, oh, at this, this idea of, you, you see that the trees are represented kind of as a stamp, so with perfectly trimmed lines to create the limits of, of the space. So this is you, about... Do you think this is an stamp? No, not a stamp, but, but they are all more or less the same. So it's, and it's mm -hmm. different species of trees, so it's just about creating creating masses of trees to, to kind of close or open spaces and views around the, around the crematorium <laughs> and around this processional path that crosses the, the site. And uh, other utopian ideas, so this is Super Studio, early, super in, super his, yeah, <laughs> earlier in their career in, in, in Florence, uh, imagining the, sorry, this is Gradis, I'm sorry. Uh, but, but similar to a, a design that he did in, in Florence, it, it, it's, it's just about starting uh, to think about superstructures and ways of completely redefining mm -hmm. uh, the territory, in this case by constructing a superstructure against the cent uh, around the center of grass, flooding it. So you create instantly a new uh, landscape for the center of the city. And, and there's several of these where it shows several stages of the, the water coming no, up. Yeah. The water is coming yeah. up. <laughs> and sinking all the buildings until what's left is just the the hill of the castle as kind of an island in the middle of the lake. You see the, the superstructure they created. And then this, this, this idea of the superstructure is something that continues throughout their career in several uh, projects. Uh, and it becomes a device that colonizes the entire territory and it is capable of building the, the world. So in this very first phase, it's something that is connected to a, to, a, to a precise context in a city where they are proposing an intervention. By the later phase, it becomes a narrative about how to, to build a structure that goes uh, across the world in the ad infinitum. 